Welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Dr. Anjali Daimari, Associate Professor in the Department of English, Guwahati University. We are now doing the course Indian Writing in English and the module that we have before us is Savaging the Civilized, Where are Elwin, His Tribals and India by Ramachandra Guha. Born in Dehradun on 29th April 1958, Ramachandra Guha is the leading historian, biographer, columnist and a prolific writer of contemporary India. He is primarily interested in social, political, environmental and cricket history. He had a schooling in Dune School, Dehradun, studied degree in St. Stephen's College, Delhi and did his master's from Delhi School of Economics. He taught in Yale and Stanford universities and was visiting faculty in London School of Economics for the academic session 211 and 212. In fact, he was conferred the Bharat Bhushan in 2009 and in 2011 he was awarded the Sahitya Academy for his work India after Gandhi. The over of Ramachandra Guha's writing rests on his varied interests. Unquiet Words, published in 1989, deals with the history of Chipko movement as Guha realized as a historian that nothing much has been studied about the peasants who are largely affected by the environment. He mentions in the preface of the book that as, and I quote, the relationship between colonialism and ecological decline is neglected by the historians of modern India who have been rather more aware of the social and political consequences of British rule, unquote. This made Guha endeavor to alter the trend by drawing a relation between social and ecological basis of the movement. An anthropologist among the Marxists and other essays is a collection of polemics and sketches of renowned Indians. In fact, his works render a critical perspective to the issues he deals with which amply finds expression in his work, India after Gandhi, the history of the world's largest democracy, which throws light on the momentous occurrences in Indian history, emphasizing the basis of its past and present together with its politics, culture and society. The book also provides an insight into issue of a country like India, which is beset with discrimination based on caste, creed, religion and language, and has also been able to emerge as the largest democracy of the world. In Gandhi Before India, Goa explores the early life of Gandhi which were not much known to people, rendering a close look at the ideologies and philosophies which Gandhi followed in the early period of his life. Ramachandra Guha's Savaging the Civilized, Warrior Elvin and his Tribal Question, published in 1999, is a biography which traces the extraordinary life of Warrior Elvin. Guha's interest in Elvin's life and works roused after going through Elvin's writings during the academic and research periods of his life. In the preface of the biography, Guha dotingly mentions that it is his favorite book among the ones he has written so far and will remain so. Getting in touch with Elvin had fascinated him to such an extent 
that he switched to sociology from economics for his doctoral research. In fact, Guha traveled to all the places where El Elvin had lived and worked in India as well as in England. That shows how passionate he was about the work that he was doing on Verrier Elvin. He attempted to know Elvin from his writings as well. He made use of archival materials available and also took into account of what other people had written about Elvin. He quoted passages from Elvin's autobiography, The Tribal World of Vader Elvin, published in 1964, and a number of Elvin's poems are also incorporated in the biography. A writer and ethnographer, Vader Elvin was born in the year 1902. He was a devout Christian and had formal training to be a missionary as his father was an Anglican bishop. Elwin had his education in London and following his family tradition took his doctorate degree in theology. It is since the time he was a student in the Oxford University, Elwin was fascinated by exotic Indian culture history, people, and so on. Hence, he decided to come to India after meeting J.C. Winslow, who had been working in India as a missionary and was on a recruitment drive in London to appoint young people for the mission. During his Oxford days, Elvin had the notion that Indians were not capable of governing themselves. It was after meeting Bernard Alubiha that he came to know about the true picture. From him, Elvin heard about the internationalist culture of Rabindranath Tagore and non-violent idealism of Mahatma Gandhi. Alubiha also gave him a few books to read on Indian philosophy and tenets of Hinduism. Those books helped Elvin a great extent to change his outlook towards India. He did not support the suppression of the Indians by the British. His coming to India was a gesture to compensate for the damage that his countrymen had caused to India. He thus said, and I quote him, that from my family, somebody should go to give instead of to get, to serve with the poorest people instead of ruling them, to become one with the country that we have helped to dominate and subdue, unquote. It was his sense of responsibility towards the subjugated and downtrodden Indians that he chose to work among them. In fact, he began a lot of development programs in India for the tribes, in fact, for the many tribes that he was working with. Without being a trained anthropologist, his interaction with the tribes turned him to be a proficient field worker. His dealings with the tribes who were ignored by the British to be outside the mainstream India made him realize the plight of the marginalized status that they had at that period of time. It also endowed him with the scope to apprehend their life's magnificence, rationality and greatness. His writings on the Adivasis of various parts of India exhibit an intense sense of compassion and affection for their existence. In fact, he went on to marry one of the women from one of the tribes. 
at the time when the nationalists of the country including Mahatma Gandhi were talking about eradication of untouchability, emancipation of women and Hindu Muslim Union, the specific needs and requirements of the Adivasis were not taken into account by the ones who shaped political discourse in the later part of colonial India. Guha in this context notes that and I quote him, Elwin's work underscores the failures of Indian nationalism in understanding the predicament of the Adivasis, unquote. The Adivasis were exploited strategically and were excluded politically. Elwin's writings, Guha believes, can still be referred in terms of the Adivasis. Elvin's first encounter with Mahatma Gandhi was in Sabarmati Ashram when he first visited it in January 1928. He was totally mesmerized by the Mahatma and got himself completely involved in the ashram and began to spin, wheel and deliver sermons. Mahatma Gandhi was regarded as the unacknowledged Christ of Hinduism by Elwin. He wrote a pamphlet, Christ and Satyagraha, which appeared in the year 1930. Elwin took part in the Indian independence movement with Gandhi. In the year 1930, Gandhi adopted him as his son. Elwin on the advice of Thakkar Bapa, Sardar Patel and Jamanal Bajaj worked with the tribes of central India. He began to work with the Gaunt tribes and with the support of Shamra Hivale opened a school and a dispensary. Mahatma Gandhi in the year 1932 secretly sent him to the northwest frontier to acquire an evaluation of the political situation of that place. In the 1940s, however, an ideological clash between Elwin and Gandhi crept in. He alienated himself from Gandhi as he realized that Gandhian ideals were not suitable for the tribal's way of life. On the other hand, Elvin was influenced to a great extent by Nehru's method of developing the tribes, keeping in mind their customs and traditions. The Elvin Nehru Association from then onwards became instrumental in the formation of many development policies for the tribals. Guha notes that Elvin wrote extensively not only about tribal customs of India but also on art, myth and folklore of the country. From editorials, reviews, monologues, pamphlets, travelogues to poems and novels, Elvin's competence as a writer is exhibited. His autobiography which he wrote in the last days of his life is however considered as the best among all. In the year 1932, Guha mentions after he went to Gaunt, his interest shifted from politics to social work, which reflected through another of his works, Leaves from the Jungle, published in 1936, which is the record of his activities of the earlier period in Mandla. Elvin further talks in it about the necessity to safeguard some of the gaunt culture and also celebrates the irreverent and irrepressible gaiety of the Gons. However, realizing the fact that he could help the tribals by writing about them, Elvin left the rest of the work such as education and medical relief to Shamrao Hivale. In Guha's words, and I quote him, 
writing was for him a more natural medium than giving injections or running schools." Unquote. He also transcribed and translated the poems written by the tribals, thinking those would make the urban readers consider them as real people, real as themselves. In the year 1937, his novel, Pulmat of the Hills, was published, which narrates the story of a Pradhan girl who is abandoned by her lover as she suffered from leprosy. The other novel, The Cloud That's Dragonish, is about witchcraft. The Baiga, published in 1939, and the Agariya, published in 1942 are his works which are based on the lives of two tribal communities. Guha expresses his wonder about Elvin's unusual ability to observe tribal life so closely. His other two works, the Aboriginals published in 1943 and the Muria and their Ghotal published in 1946, according to Guha, are evocative portrayals of tribal cultures. Maria Murder and Suicide, published in 1943, is based on his observation of the murders and suicide that took place among the Bison Horn Maria, who was considered to be a very violent community. He tried to find out the actual causes of the occurrences by visiting the village where it happened. Elwin expected that his work would influence the judgment against the accused aboriginals. Working with the tribals made Verrier Elwin come into terms with many facts related to them, illuminating a lot of their socio-cultural practices. He realized in the course of his association with them that there was no uniformity between the tribal communities. They have their own distinct customs, laws and beliefs. Elvin established an ashram in Karanjia village. In order to understand the tribals better, he began to live with them. He made every effort to remove superstitions and ignorance from their minds. Everything about them, such as their rituals of birth and death, system of marriage, sexual practices, food habit, music and dance, magic, regulatory system, etc. became familiar to him. Elvin got much closer to these people in spite of all the harassment imposed upon him for indulging in anti-establishment activities by the British government as well as by the ecclesiastical authority. He even got married to Kosi, a young gone girl as I had mentioned earlier in the year 1940 following all the tribal rituals. Later, he married a Pardhan girl named Leela from Patangar. Elwin had a strong association with Northeast India. In the year 1952, he expressed his desire to Jawaharlal Nehru to visit Assam. He wanted to make a study of the objects of the region to write the sequel of his work Tribal Arts of Middle India. But the then governor of Assam, Jay Ramdas Dalatram, thought that Elvin could be of much better use for him and his government. So he asked him to prepare a report on the tribes of the region, especially those who were likely to rebel against the authority. Elvin was then offered the directorship of anthropological survey by the education minister of the government of India. Elvin 
prepared a report on the tribes of the region, specifically those who were likely to rebel against the authority. Nehru was so pleased with the report of Elwin that he sent it to all the state's chief ministers. The report emphasized on the fact that any kind of imposition over the tribals would make them apprehensive of the developmental programs meant for them. In the year 1953, Elvin was made the tribal advisor to the administration of NEFA, that is Northeast Frontier Agency by Jawaharlal Nehru. Verrier Elvin traveled extensively to all the tribal areas of the region, including the disturbed Naga Hills. He was utterly disheartened by the condition of the Tagins who were suffering from dermatitis. There had been a lot of other challenges that Elvin had to face in the region. He had been witness to the Chinese invasion of Nefa and during and after that period his philosophy of Nefa was completely denounced by all the sections of the society. Ghurye, an Indian anthropologist, criticized him immensely in print. Another incident that occurred at that time was the Tagin's killing of a number of Assam Rifles employees. But Elvin very delicately handled the matter, saying that at such situations, military help was required to pacify the agitated tribals. His attitude towards the tribals has been sympathetic all throughout. Guha endeavored to render a comprehensive account of Elvin as a man, missionary, Gandhian, writer, social worker, tribal activist, ethnographer, and anthropologist. He clearly states that his narrative in the biography is purely anchored in the central character and it will lose its real meaning if interpreted theoretically. Reading of Savaging the Civilized would make one ponder whether Elvin had not done something that an Indian would do. He left his homeland and made the forests in India his home, defied the puritanical ideas of his own religion for the sake of the tribals. Moreover, he abandoned his mission as he never converted a single Indian and dedicated his entire life protecting the tribals of India. Guha has mentioned in the biography that Elvin was the first Englishman to acquire an Indian citizenship. He further indicates in it that Elvin had been possessive about the tribals whom he thought to be his own people and always considered him one with them. Guha makes it very obvious while narrating the life of Elvin that the man who called himself the British born Indian never compromised with anything to sustain the freedom of the indigenous people. No matter it was within the establishment or outside the establishment, Elvin never wavered from his path. Thus, reading of Savaging the Civilized gives a fair idea of the fact that it is not a mere biography as Guha blends history while telling the life of Verrier Elvin. Through the work, Guha also looks into some of the serious debates of 20th century such as future of development, cultural assimilation and difference, post-colonial and colonial government. Guha did not only narrate the life Elvin had lived in the biography, he tried to track the legacies that Elvin had left after his death in the year 1964. He talks about the disputed legacies as in 1964 there was a report in the Times of India that 
the government of India would award a fellowship in the memory of Warrior Elwin. The fellowship would be provided to the one who wished to work in the inaccessible corners outside India. Things obviously have changed since Elwin died. The forests have been encroached, dams were made and lands destroyed by mines. But Elwin's effort to retain the identity of the tribes is apparent in some places. Guha's visit to Mandla provides him with the experience of the Gond tribes still practicing their customs and traditions with the same fervor as before. Guha also met all his family members, that is Elwin's family members, including his two wives and children and provides an account of their whereabouts. Elwin undoubtedly lived a remarkable life. The meticulously drawn facts, skillfully used materials and weaving it to a narrative of exclusive kind make Guha's biography of Elwin, Savaging the Civilized, a classic one. So in writing Savaging the Civilized, Warrior Elwin, his, his tribals and India, Ramachandra Guha has attempted a biography with a difference. Published in 1999, his writing a biography on Vera Elwin definitely serves a purpose in the sense that Vera Elwin had a huge role to play so far as northeast of India was concerned. And, and the writing of this biography in a sense raises important questions which as students of literature one can address especially when when warrior elvin talks about the various tribes about questions of deforestation and all these issues which are very pertinent in the present context and the way that Ramachandra Guha brings it into the foreground is very, very relevant in the present time. And so a reading of Ramachandra Guha's Savaging the Civilized, Vader Elvin, His Tribals and India by the students is of relevance in the present time will also help you to understand about India's relationship uh, with the various tribes in India.